Hello. When I give tarot card workshops and trainings, naturally people are curious uh, where the cards come from. Tarot cards originate in uh, playing cards and playing cards go back to ancient China. When the Chinese invented woodblock printing, which was about 12 or 1300 years ago, or maybe earlier, um, they made mass production possible. You don't actually carve the text into the block. You, you carve the block out around the text. Um, and then you can just layer the surface, the remaining surface, with paint, uh, with color, with ink, and lay paper on it and you get the image that you want. Ar artistic woodblock prints, you know, are well known from China and Japan. I think the most famous woodblock print is probably the, one, the Japanese painting of the Great Wave with Mount Fuji in the background. But that was much later. When the Chinese invented woodblock printing, um, one of the oldest surviving woodblock prints is from Gautam Buddha's Diamond Sutra, in Chinese, of course, um, which is Buddha's dialogues with Subhuti, his disciple, Subhuti, the original Subhuti, <laughs> which is nice. That's the name Osho gave me. And uh, But of course, when you make an, uh, an invention like that, you can't control it. Um, so it, woodblock printing wasn't just reserved for spiritual and or, or even higher education it uh, it quickly developed into some into a form of entertainment which was uh, printing playing cards and then um, I mean it's interesting isn't it that you know any great invention can be used for higher education or for lower <laughs> entertainment and the same thing has happened very recently with with television and with the internet and you you can't control the forms of expression a new invention will take. These playing cards had to get from China to uh, to Europe, which took a few hundred years and went through Egypt. It went, went through the Middle East, Arabia and Egypt. And it was just after the Crusades. The last Christian soldiers had been expelled from the Middle East, from Palestine, from the Levant. And the Mamluks, who were uh, a kind of interesting kind of slave caste of soldiers, military soldiers, who were employed by rulers, local Muslim rulers, to take care of, you know, <laughs> law and order. They eventually decided that they would uh, take over the, you know, well, thanks very much, we'll take over everything. And that's what they did. So the Mamluks uh, had playing cards. Very sim They weren't very, they weren't pictorial. They were more, you know, symbolic. Um, and they came to Italy. As far as we know, the first playing cards appeared in Italy, um, in Florence, um, and maybe Milan. You know, it was the beginning of the Renaissance, so I, we probably couldn't have, the church wouldn't have allowed it any earlier than that. Um, but it was the beginning of the Renaissance, and you know, Florence was flourishing, and uh, and they, the first sets of playing cards appeared in Florence and uh, quickly spread from there. When card games became popular in Italy, of course the church was dead against it. Um, the church has been dead against <laughs> most things that, uh, but um, particularly because it was a, so they feared it as a source of gambling, which of course it became. And by the way, it made me wonder, what were Europeans playing with before playing cards? And I had to look that up. And, or dice, of course, they were playing with dice. Um, but they also were playing with something called knuckle bones. And I thought, what the hell is knuckle bones? And actually, it's um, jacks. I don't know if you've ever played it. But when I was a kid, there was a craze at school of uh, playing jacks. Which, you know, you throw a ball in the air and you pick up as many jacks as you can and then in various ways. And you know, you were really cool if you managed to do the whole thing. And of course, when the Europeans discovered the printing press, which was you know, high tech, a technology which allowed the rapid dissemination of information across Europe, and 
they also, of course, you know, they didn't just print Bibles. They, um, they printed playing cards. And that's how playing cards spread across Europe. And uh, the original suits were, uh, were not uh, clubs, diamonds, hearts and spades, which uh, we use now. The original suits were coins, which later became discs, wands, cups, and, oh my God, I forgot the last one, coins and swords, of course, swords. <laughs> swords, yes, and uh, those uh, suits are still played today, I'm, I'm told, in Southern Europe. Um, and then the Italians, and this is a strange idea, because we, we play cards with trumps. But we decide, OK, spades are trumps or hearts are trumps or diamonds are trumps. But they created a whole trump suit of 21 cards. I don't know where they got that idea, but they did. So there was a whole suit of 21 cards that were trumps. And they added that to the four suits of coins, wands, swords and cups. And there you have the basis of the modern tarot cards. Then the deck that we know today... Uh, became a source of divination and you know you th you wonder how or why that happened but actually it's not you know how a game suddenly became you you know something that could tell you your future or tell you something about yourself um, but it's not hard to imagine how that happened because in fact human beings have been using divination for thousands of years. I mean, the ancient Greeks used to tell for, you know, tell, foretell significant events from pigs' bladders or from the ravings of lunatics. And, of course, the great oracle of Delphi, they used to get these poor young women, you know, like young virgins, and uh, sit them in a room or over a stove, <laughs> and they would... In they would make them breathe all these herbal smokes and stuff. And of course they would, they would go out of their minds and they would start making utterances. And then the, the priests who were controlling the whole thing, of course, the male priests, um, would, would try and make sense or, or would draw their inspiration from the, the, these poor young women who were stoned out of their minds on these herbs. They didn't last very long, apparently. And then, of course, in Rome, you had in the famous Shakespeare play, Julius Caesar. You know, he's about to go down and, and meet the, the politicians, the, you know, in the Senate or something. And, uh, and his wife says, don't go. I've got a really bad feeling about, you know, going down and meeting these guys today. And he says, no, no. I mean, and then she finds out that the, the augurers, you know, the fortune tellers, they opened up some beast, some cow or something. And they couldn't find a heart within the within the beast and this was a very bad sign and she said Julius you know please don't go down to the senate or the Colosseum <laughs> or wherever he was going and he said no no he said it's fine you know I'm basically immortal and of course like most people who think they're immortal he uh, he quickly found out that he wasn't every culture has um, you know dreams sounds of birds in the night uh, chirping of crickets anything and, and of course, crystal balls, looking into crystal, staring into crystal balls or, you know, throwing coins um, or the I Ching was done with sticks, uh, yarrow stalks. So it's not it's not at all. And, and of course, some people um, even today tell fortunes by ordinary playing cards, you know, clubs, diamonds. Um, so it's not at all uh, unexpected or surprising that um, the tarot deck which was a deck of playing cards at the time, should become a source of divination. And that happened you know, in the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries. As people used the Tarot deck more and more for divination, it acquired more significance and more symbolism. For example, the Major Arcana became a, a map, in a way, of the journey uh, through life, the major milestones were represented by the the 22 cards also the major arcana was seen as a a map of the spiritual journey from basically from human ignorance to human awakening or enlightenment so it uh, it became more and more loaded with uh, with these interpretations and the minor arcana was seen more as the sort of uh, 
the daily experiences that we encounter on the way. Uh, and uh, each suit, of course, everybody's a, uh, everybody has a different interpretation or description, but uh, each suit of the minor arcana uh, acquired a different meaning. For example, cups was associated with the element water and uh, the quality of love and, and intimacy. And uh, then we have wands, which was uh, fire and uh, uh, life experience. And then we have uh, swords, uh, air and uh, mind and all the head trips that we go through. And finally, discs, earth and wisdom. So in a way, it kept growing and developing as, uh, as interest in it increased over the centuries. There have, been, there have been many different theories about the purpose of the tarot cards, and I, I just I got a new one uh, the other day. Somebody told me that a sociologist had stated that, that the creation of the tarot deck with its uh, trumps and four suits was really a, a, a device by the ruling elite, by the, by the powerful and the wealthy, to somehow manipulate the masses to accept social change from feudalism through through the Renaissance to capitalism and modern society. <laughs> That's a bit of a stretch <laughs> for me. I mean, I'm sure the ruling elite, you know, in any society does its best to manipulate the masses. You know, they're doing very well at the moment in the 21st century, thanks to modern media. Um, but I don't really get that. You, you know, you have visions of a bunch of uh, the, the Medici in Florence sort of getting around a table and saying, look, you know, here's a good idea. Why don't we use the tarot cards to manipulate the masses, you know? Uh, I think probably alcohol <laughs> did, did a much better job, you know. Anyway, it's a theory, it's a possibility. And then that, that tarot deck or that, that suit, that Italian-made suit of playing cards, actually died out in Italy but was passed on and flourished in France and Switzerland and eventually became one of the most popular tarot decks of all time, which is the Tarot de Marseille, or the French deck, as it's called sometimes. And that's still in use today. Um, and then we have the, the other two modern, relatively modern, very popular decks around the world. Uh, one is the Rider Waite deck, which was published in 1910, and then the Alistair Crowley Thoth deck, which was published um, in the, you know, after the war, 1950s, I think. Um, and uh, we should say a little bit about the Rider Waite deck because Arthur Waite was was as was a member of the. The Order of the Golden Dawn, which was a very highly structured and secretive spiritual organization with different layers and somehow associated with the Freemasons, though I don't know how. And uh, <clears throat> he was the one who uh, had the ideas about the tarot cards and Pamela Coleman Smith was the woman who painted the cards. and She painted 78 cards in, in a year. And she was a very mysterious woman because she basically came out of nowhere. I think she had American parents and born in England. Um, and she started having visions of these cards and painted the cards. And then she never married. She never had children. She lived a very, you know, uh, she lived a very quiet life with, I think, with one other woman in an apartment and died in 1951 and it was almost as if her whole life's purpose was in painting those 78 tarot cards in one year very extraordinary and then we come to the alistair crowley deck the book of thoth as he called it um it's an interesting thing about crowley that he he led an extraordinary life. You know, he was totally into magic. He really believed in spiritual powers. And he was kind of hungry to, 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 he really thought that if he could unlock the secrets of the past, like of ancient Egypt and, 
and the Kabbalah and uh, all of those things, he, he, he would acquire great spiritual and magical powers. And uh, he wrote prolifically. He wrote about just about everything. You know, he, he, I think he really saw himself as a great commentator on a wide range of events. And, uh, and then at the very end of his life, this was in uh, early 1940s, he got together with the Lady Frida Harris and uh, created the 78 cards of the Thoth Tarot deck. And he, even, and he died before they were printed. And yet that's the only thing people remember about Crowley. Um, of course, those who study him understand all those other aspects of his work. But as far as his impact on our social culture is concerned, none of those writings have much effect. Well, what's left at the end of the day is 78 beautiful, powerful tarot cards painted under his guidance by Lady Frida Harris and published after he died and after she died. And uh, it's a little bit ironic in a way that those those picture cards, um, if, he'd know, if he'd known uh, that that was going to be the case, he could have saved himself a lot of hard work. Um, but there you are. That's how it goes. So we have the, um, the Tarot de Marseille. That's still widely popular. We have the Rider Waite deck and we have the, uh, the Crowley deck. Um, they're all widely distributed and used around the world. And, uh, and then we have, uh, all, uh, uh, there, there's been an explosion of different decks. I mean, the, the Mother Peace Goddess deck is very popular. And the um, and Mardeva Padma's um, Osho Zen deck um, is also widely used. I think the appeal of the Tarot uh, is the same now as it's always been, which is you know, people want to feel that they're doing the right thing, that they're making the right decisions in life, and they feel supported uh, by the what, what is reflected in the cards. Of course, you don't always want, uh, you don't, you're free not to take the advice that the cards are giving you. That's your freedom. Um, but I think when you see what the cards reflect, there's this feeling, oh yes, um, that's what I was thinking, or that's what I was feeling, or yeah, well, you know, I wanted to do something else, but I think that makes more sense. So this feeling of being in tune with the flow of your own life and with your own deeper intelligence, and also this longing everybody has, I think, to feel connected with, um, with the greater mystery, that somehow the tarot hooks you in or connects you to existence or you know some uh, dimension beyond yourself something a greater feeling that's important um, and the and the tarot works of course a great deal depends on the uh, skill of the tarot reader but um, it works and I think it always will and, and that's its appeal and that's the end of my little talk about the history of the tarot cards bye bye